<laughs> That's amazing. The dogs, the dogs, the dogs. Is that even a real story? That's a fact. This is complete nonsense, Greg. Right? Read a book. I guess you are kind of artistic. Incredible. What are you even talking about, man? Go for broke. I don't even know what that means. Let's get it going. Let's get it going. Keep it going, baby. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We are back. It's Barkology Podcast. This is Scott and my buddy Greg sitting right across from me as usual. Oh, yeah. Uh, today's going to be a little bit different than we uh, than we typically do. Uh, we have a couple firsts for uh, the day. We have our first guest. Oh, and yeah. we also have our first Skype call guest, I guess is how I would refer to it. So uh, we have a, a, a very interesting guy on the call with us or on the podcast with us today. His name's Robert Forto. Um, we're super excited to have him on. He actually reached out to us. Uh, I think it was via Instagram initially, um, but it, it's, it's going to be interesting to hear his perspective on a lot of things because he lives on the complete other opposite side of the world. Basically, he lives in Alaska. <laughs> it might as well be the other side. It I mean, basically ge- geographically, is. Geographically, not the other side, but... Yes, yeah, so far enough away. But um, with no further ado, um, actually, a little bit further ado, uh, we'll actually do a little bit of the uh, typical Barkology podcast at the end. Well, there's a couple updates we have to give everyone, a couple current events that Greg and I need to discuss. Uh, but now, with no further ado, uh, Robert Forto. And Robert, uh, a brief introduction for me, and then he'll be able to tell you a little bit about himself. He is a dog musher. Uh, he's been doing it for years. I mean, longer than I've almost been alive. I'm just kidding, Robert. Uh, but he's been a dog musher and trainer. He lives in the wilds of Alaska. He has a team of 40 sled dogs. He's been involved with a with dogs professionally since 1994 so i was born in 1989 so that's a long time he probably knows dogs better than i know most people um but robert why don't you introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit about yourself hey guys yep my name is robert forto i'm calling in today from willow alaska it is about an hour and a half north of anchorage we live up here, as you mentioned, with a pack of sled dogs. We currently have 40 dogs down in the yard. So if any of them are barking, it is a dog podcast. So hopefully that doesn't uh, make any of your listeners upset. But yeah, I have been up here for about 10 years now, moved up from Colorado, and I'm up here to stay and absolutely love it. Awesome, awesome. And no, we will we will not judge you if we hear any dogs barking because it's become kind of a tradition for us that – for whatever reason we typically do the podcast at 4 30 p.m and about an hour in my dogs start getting a little bit antsy and i have to typically go feed them mid podcast so absolutely no judgment there but where did you uh, live in colorado uh we lived up in the mountains outside of denver in a little town called bailey and that's where i introduced my wife to the sport of dog sledding and uh, you know one thing led to another and we packed up the proverbial u-haul and, and moved up here in uh, 2010 i guess it was awesome how how close to colorado springs is that uh, it's about an hour and a half west of colorado springs okay okay yeah the reason i was asking is because i have a lot of family that lives right in denver um my cousins went to kent denver high school i don't know if that means anything to you but um i've also been up in steamboat and worked on uh, my uncle's ranch for a little bit so colorado's beautiful um but yeah yeah so tell me a little bit about the move man that's quite a hike to just pack up and go well we'll jump right into a cool story my daughter was 12 years old and Right before the 4th of July, back in 2010, uh, we decided to take a trip up here to to look around and see what was up. And uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. My wife was back at the dog training center. It was a Saturday afternoon, and she was busy with group classes and, you know, working with clients. So we jumped on a plane. We flew up to Alaska, and we checked out this really old rundown cabin, the place where we're at right now. And and, you know, the realtor was standing there, and I remember telling my daughter, her name's Nicole, I said, okay, Nicole, this is what I want you to do. I want you to text your mom and tell her whether we're going to move to Alaska or not. And I left it thoroughly in the hands of a 12-year-old, and she texted mom, and she said, <laughs> oh, we're moving to Alaska. And, and one thing led to another, and here we are. Yeah, it's, it's a lot easier for your wife to say no to you than your daughter, I bet, right? <laughs> 
That's exactly right. That's, that's an awesome story, though. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. All right. So uh, remind me again. So how long have you been living in Alaska then? Uh, we moved up here August of 2010. So just coming on nine years now. All right. All right. So prior to doing any sort of mushing uh, or anything like that, uh, what were you doing with dogs professionally, you know, back in the 90s? Back in the 90s, I was going to Portland State there in Portland, Oregon, and I wanted to go to vet school. And I quickly realized I did not want to spend all of my time in some vet clinic, you know, wearing the, the lab coat and doing all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I was a broke college student. I didn't have any money whatsoever. So I decided to take uh, a, a dog leash and, and my puppy out to some of the parks there. And I started soliciting people for dog training. And here I was, uh, 21, 22 years old, and I was handing out business cards. And I had a smile on my face, and one thing led to another. And, and I started teaching there in the parks, and that turned into a full-time career. That's awesome. It's like a true entrepreneur spirit. I love it. I love it. Oh, yeah. Um, all right. Well, cool, cool, man. So, you know, actually, I wanted to mention one thing before we got started here. Um, I just recently watched – you guys get Netflix out in Alaska, right? Yes, we do. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but I was just watching a recent uh, – there's a series called Losers, and it's a bunch of little uh, documentary shorts, but I was watching a uh, episode, and it was about a woman named Allie Zirkel. I, th I think that's how you pronounce her name, but she uh, – you probably know a little bit more about her than I do, but she was a woman who went to the University of Pes Pennsylvania, I think, initially, so she was clearly a very smart woman uh, going to an Ivy League school, but – ended up moving out to Alaska, and I can't remember what led her out there, but she has a similar living situation to you, I, I would guess. She basically lives with all of her dogs, uh, kind of out in the middle of nowhere, but uh, she was, she ran the Iditarod, she raced the Iditarod, I guess. I don't really know what the wordage is to explain. Do you run it? Do you race it? But um, it, it was a pretty cool story, and do, do you know who I'm talking about? Sorry to just ramble on here. Oh, yeah. She, she's a friend of mine, and I, I have to say she's much more hardcore than I am. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. I mean, I got the feeling just by looking at the uh, the interview on, on Netflix that she was a pretty intense individual. But, you know, the, the fact alone that she finished second multiple times and, you know, in the top 20 multiple oh. times was unbelievable. Impressive. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. She, she's cool. So the story on Netflix, they talk about her running the race and someone with a snowmobile running her and another racer over. Can, how true is that? Tell us more about that. That That's exactly what happened. I guess it was uh, three or four years ago now. Uh, here in Alaska, most people, uh, what they call out in the bush, are traveling up and down the rivers and on the trails on snow machines because they do not have roads out there. And, and my understanding of this is it was late one night and she and uh, another dog musher named Jeff King were on the Yukon river and the Yukon river is about a mile and a half wide. So it's kind of like the super highway of rural Alaska. And there was a guy out there and uh, he was pretty drunk and just doing his thing as, as uh, you know, drunk people do. And he decided to take it upon himself to try to run these two guys over. And it, it was obviously a very harrowing scene. Uh, one of uh, the other mushers, Jeff King's dogs, ended up dying from, oh. from, from the event. And, you know, this guy was just plowing into him, thinking about, you know, just an out of control driver on the interstate somewhere. And that's exactly what was happening here, except it was on a snow machine in the middle of nowhere. Sure. So uh, that's terrible to hear. So the, the documentary or not the documentary, the, the mini series, or if you want to call it mini that, doc. um, made it seem like he was almost out to get them. Like he targeted them. How true is that? Or was it just some, some drunk guy going on a, on a, on a spree? I, I think it's more of the latter, uh, you know, what, you know how it is when when you're have had a few too many and you get out there and you don't know exactly exactly knows what happens and I think that's more to it than you know out there targeting dog mushers because you know this is truly the state sport and it's it's you know one of those things that that uh, is very well received in most mm -hmm. of villages in Alaska so maybe he had a vendetta I don't know 
just a little side note is he comes from a very um, a dog mushing family, very dog mushing centric family. His his family has has been in, involved with the sport for many years, huh. and you know I think he's you know kind of a, a cousin or a nephew or something of of one of the past I did a rod mushers. But yeah, he oh. uh, he's out there doing his thing, and, and unfortunately it turned into a really bad accident. Yikes. Yeah, I mean, I'll play devil's advocate on that. It, it seems like the visibility and a lot of the stuff that's going on out there is, you know, he might not really have been able to see what was going on. I mean, who knows, especially if you're blackout drunk, just ripping a, a snowmobile through, you know, down by the Yukon River. It's it's pretty intense. I, I got to imagine. But um, that's wild. That's wild. So, yeah. uh, oh, you mentioned that the uh, that the state sport of Alaska is dog mushing. Right. Ah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, I don't know. Does New York have a state sport? I do not know. That, yeah, I don't Should know either. That up. That's cool, though. That's cool. I know uh, Greg and I both played lacrosse, and I know that lacrosse uh, is actually probably more popular in a lot of Canada than it is in some parts of the United States. So um, that's interesting to hear that dog mushing is the state sport. That's pretty cool. You know, I used to play lacrosse way back in the day, and, and I, I remember just going out there and just, just trying to be – I used to have the, the, the word Terminator on my helmet. I used to play deep. <laughs> oh, and, right. And I'd, I'd play short stick defense, and this was back in the mid-'80s when, when lacrosse was really taking off. And I remember just going out there and just having a blast, just going out there. And I thought I was on a hockey rink, but you know how it is with lacrosse stick. You get out there, and you can, you can do some things uh, – that uh, you can't do in other sports for sure. I know it gets a little bit aggressive, but that's why we love it, right, Greg? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I did look up state sports in the United States, and there's only about ten states listed. New York is not one of them. Yeah. I think it's I think it's universally you just kind of choose if you want to have a state yes. sport, I guess. Yes. But no, the national sport of Canada is lacrosse. Excellent. Yes, you would, you would think it's hockey. Hockey, but it's not. Good no. to know. Good to know. Mm-hmm. Well, cool. All right, so, Robert, why don't, why don't you just break down, you know, just because my perception of what dog mushing is is probably a lot different than what it actually is. So do us a favor and just break down a little bit, you know, what is dog mushing, um, maybe kind of debunk some of the possible myths that people might think living over here on the East Coast. Um, so just kind of elaborate however you will. All right. Well, dog, the sport of dog mushing got started, I don't know, 100 years or so ago uh, when a lot of the folks in the in rural parts of not only Alaska, but the world uh, would carry mail and packages and whatnot uh, from village to village using a, a dog team. And of course, in the off time, they, they had to have something to do. And since they didn't have football or, or lacrosse or hockey or whatever, they decided to turn it into a sport. And mushing, uh, the sport of dog mushing started that way. And most of the time, it was sprint mushing on the weekend. So all of these trappers and miners and, and, and delivery guys and all that would get together their best dogs and then they would run races, uh, you know, and of course, uh, it was bragging rights and, you know, a good time to, to earn a living and whatnot. So that's sort of how the sport of dog mushing got started. Okay. And then, Sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt you. So what's the difference between a sprint? I mean, I, I can break it down how I might think it is, but what's the difference between a sprint and maybe like a traditional race nowadays? That's a good question. Sprint mushing is very similar to like track and field events. So like the 400 meter or the, you know, something like that. It's, it's really a, a short distance dog sled race. And if we can go into it a little further, typically sprint dog mushing is the number of dogs you have on your team. And that equals the number of miles. So if you're running a four dog team, you're running a four mile race. If you're running a six dog team, six mile race, so on and so forth. Okay. Now, okay. long distance mushing is is what you talked about uh, in your in your intro there with the Netflix series Losers. That is uh, long distance mushing, and that is typically anything over 150 miles. So you have 150 mile races. 300 mile races, 500 mile races, and then up to the thousand mile races like the Iditarod and the Yukon Quest. So, wow. I've got a question here for you. In the the marathons, the 150 mile races, will they use the same dogs the entire race or will they swap out dogs? 
Yeah, you have to use the same dogs in sprint mushing or in distance mushing. Uh, occasionally in sprint mushing, you can start with a pool of dogs. So let's say you come to the race and it's a multiple day race like the Fur Rondi here in uh, Anchorage, and you have a pool of maybe 20. So in distance mushing, you have to start with X number of dogs. So in the Iditarod, which is what we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. you start out with a team of 14 dogs. And then along the trail, sometimes those dogs are dropped for various reasons. The dog may be injured, tired, sick, or it could be part of your strategy to drop some of these dogs along the trail mm. so you can finish with a stronger, smaller team as you're going. And that's very typical in, in, in uh, dog mushing. And uh, it, that's one of the myths that, uh, that dogs are dropped because they're, they're too injured or too sick to proceed. And that's not always the case. Okay. So I, tell me a little bit about what you need to, I mean, traditionally, what are you carrying with you? Because I've got to imagine towards the end of the race, Part of the reason you can drop dogs if you choose to do so is because you're carrying less supplies and things like that. So, I mean, how, how does that work, really? Well, in distance mushing, you have to have several pieces of mandatory gear. And right off the top of my head, I know that you need an axe. Uh, you need a cold weather sleeping bag. You need two days of food for each dog on your team. You need human food, which is often very little. Uh, you have to have a cooker so you can boil water to, to melt the meat that you feed the dogs. And you have to have snowshoes and dog booties for each dog. Yeah, so that adds up. That gets pretty heavy to start, I've got to imagine, right? Yeah, you're typically leaving a race probably with two or 300 pounds of gear, I guess, uh, to start out. Wow, wow, that's pretty nuts. Okay, okay, no, that, that, that clears things up for me a little bit because whenever, in the footage that I've seen, I think it's always towards the end of the race, and there's not a ton of stuff uh, sitting inside. What, what do you call it? Just the sled? The sled, and then each sled has a sled bag, and that's used to, to carry not only the gear, but if you have to carry a dog for whatever reason, let's say that they're injured on the trail or too tired, you can take that dog off of the team and put them in the bag, and then they can uh, kick back in there and get a little bit of a rest. So they just kind of hang out in the bag. That's awesome. They hang out the bag, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so I've got a question. What is the typical – you said to defrost the meat that you bring. What is like a typical meal for a, for a, a race dog? On a distance race, they're eating about 12,000 calories a day. And typically that includes uh, uh, some type of meat, uh, whether it be – uh, beef or chicken or fish or beaver or even caribou and moose and that sort of thing. And then you mix that together with some some dry kibble, your typical, uh, you know, the food that you feed every dog in the world, but it's a little bit of a high power type kibble. And you mix all that together and you make it to in the, in the consistency of a really thick beef stew and you feed them that uh, three or four times a day. Oh, man, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, it just right off the top of my head, a lot of the things that you just mentioned that you're feeding them are, they have to be local to Alaska. You know, the beaver, the caribou, all of that kind of stuff. Um, that, that That's pretty crazy. I, I would have never thought that you would feed beaver to a dog, but I guess if you're, you're mixing it all up and then combining a lot of proteins and things like that, it's probably going to be the best source of fuel for the dogs, especially if they're expending so, you know, as much energy as you said, burning 12,000 calories a day. That's pretty insane. It, it is intense. And, you know, when you talked about that beaver, beaver is probably one of the most high fat, high protein meats that there are out there that we feed our dogs. And, and if you give them that, uh, it, it's like feeding them rocket fuel. Uh, they just are ready to rock and roll on that diet of beaver. And I know most people that are listening are thinking, oh, my God, feeding them beaver. Uh, <laughs> it is the best stuff in the world to feed a team of sled dogs. That's awesome, man. So That's could awesome. Could you ship some beaver up for Scott and I to uh, <laughs> fuel up before our big uh, big, big race or our big gym session? <laughs> before the podcast, we'll just get rocket fuel of beaver. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be like five energy uh, shots of, of beaver. I guess that uh, that would really make you rock and roll. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome, man. All right. Well, you know, the one thing, and I know that you have to expect that we're going to ask this, but as far as Greg and I are, uh, the education that we have when it comes to, to mushing and dog racing, it, it's limited to basically Balto 
and traditional movies that are that are put up, uh, you know, mainstream movies. So snow dogs, basically snow dogs, and um, you, you know, th- those are that the way that those are depicted. I'm sure there's a lot of truth behind them, um, but maybe you could break down, if you can, a little bit of the the actual truth behind them instead of just that the the cinema version of those stories. All right, so you named a few of them there. Let's start with probably the two most realistic. Uh, movies or pop culture references to dog mushing. Probably the most realistic is a movie that came out in the early 90s. It was produced by Disney, so you know your typical Disney film that has the hero and the villain and you know the feel-good crying moments uh, throughout the movie. It's called Iron Will. Yeah, next- I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Sorry, I don't want to inter- interrupt you, but uh, I, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned Shackleton because I recently read a book called Endurance, and it's all about Shackleton's incredible voyage down to the South Pole. And to be honest with you, I love reading books like this because they actually do kind of pull some of the emotion out of you. And one of the hardest parts of the book was actually reading about how they had to manage the dogs throughout the trip because at some point they honestly, you know, they had to make a decision. What are we going to do with these dogs? And they're they're your companions or living with them, sleeping with them. And then at one point you might have to eat them to survive. And it it blew my mind. Yeah. And of course that's much different than it is today. I I don't think that that's happened, uh, you know, in the last hundred years or so, but yeah, that's how it was back in the day. And then of course they, they tried to reference that a little bit in that movie, uh, eight below. Uh, the next one that you talked about was snow dogs. And that's the one that stars, Cuba Gooding Jr. and it's yep. more of a kids film and you know it's kind of slapstick and and funny and you know they do all kinds of antics and you have the dogs with human personalities and all that sort of stuff. It's a fun movie to watch. It'll give you an introduction to uh, dog mushing and the sport of it and it really shows kind of the personalities of each dog which is a really important part that I would love to get into in a little bit. And then of course sure. you have the animated stories like Balto and and uh, White Fang and things like that. And those take, of course, a lot of liberty there. You know, you have the the hero dog and, and, and whatnot. But Balto was an actual dog that uh, that ran in the serum run, which was in 1925. And they delivered uh, life-saving uh, vaccines to the, to the uh, community of Nome. There was no way to get uh, their, their uh, vaccine or their serum out there because, of course, it was in the middle of winter and you know, it was all frozen over and they had didn't have a way to get the diphtheria serum out there. And Balto was one of the lead dogs on one of the dog mushing teams. And that that part of the story is true. But of course, they they uh, they made it into a kid's film. So, you know how it goes. It's a little bit a little bit goofy, but it's definitely a, a, a movie worth watching. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So I've got a question for you here uh, in the movie Snow Dogs. When Robert Downey Jr. No, 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 that's Iron Man. Cuba Gooding Jr. Cuba Gooding Jr. <laughs> Jeez, Louise bites the dog's ear to show him who's boss. Is that true? Is that how you do it? You know that that's an old school method, kind of that alpha dog scenario. It's not done anymore, but uh, your dogs learn real quick to respect who the boss is, and that may be you. Or it may be another dog in the kennel, as they say, the alpha dog rules. And, and I think that was just a little bit of a take on that. So I should stop biting my dog's ear. <laughs> Probably not a good idea, uh, depending on your dog. You know, if it's just a goofy lab, maybe. But if you have, uh, you know, one of those other, uh, a little bit more forceful dogs, you may have an issue. Uh, he's a, a golden retriever. He's very stubborn. Um, he might actually take to the ear biting. Yeah, I'll just he's, keep trying. He is not an alpha. I'll tell no. you that right now. <laughs> um, okay, so you, Robert, you mentioned that you wanted to elaborate a little bit on. I, I think it was the personality of of the dogs that you're that you're working with in your team. Is is that correct? Right. You know, we have a lot of visitors to our our kennel. We teach uh, people how to to uh, run dog teams all the time. I'm an adjunct here at the local university. And so we have a lot of folks coming out to our kennel. And one of the first questions everybody asks is, do you know all of their names? And, and I kind of look at them and think to, think to give them a, a kind of a snide answer. And, and it, it's very similar to if you're a, a teacher in school and it takes a while for you to learn all the students' names if you're you know just starting out class and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. 
but we yes we do know all of the dogs names and um and each one of them has their own personality and and everybody that's listening to this podcast i would assume would have a dog in their life so as we know every dog that we have has their own personality and their own makeup and their own temperament and in dog mushing that uh, comes into play in a in a wide variety of of ways typically uh, the stronger temperamented dogs are are the ones that are are most willing to work for you. They're the ones that are, are easiest to train to be leaders. And then you have your followers in the pack, and and you know there's nothing wrong with that at all. The shy dogs or or the ones that are a little bit aloof m- may not make lead dogs, but they will definitely make a, a very good team dog. No, and if you, we, you just described Scott to a T. <laughs> hey, yeah. I, I fit right in, though. I mean, they, I'm important just to some degree. Slip That's him all that in the matters. back and, <laughs> I'll just... the back and and let him go. And if we could, guys, maybe I can describe what the makeup of a team is. And a, a team is, is made up, first off, the dogs in the very front of a dog team are called the lead dogs. And those are the dogs that are truly driving the team and they're listening to the the person the the dog musher in the back so if you think about it in a football reference those are your quarterbacks those are the tom brady's of of the dog mushing world and they're taking direction from the bill belichick's of the world uh uh, dog musher in the back so okay so So we hate we hate the patriots (laughs) well (laughs) but i was gonna say you just gave yourself a compliment uh because you're you're considering yourself bell bill belichick as one of the winningest coach in all of the nfl right well right well i I know i I know you guys are in upstate new york and and i didn't know the uh the coach of the of the bills so i can't really give a bills reference or maybe like (laughs) i don't know (laughs) <laughs> uh, that's okay uh, so how so when you're training dogs how do you how do you pick out the lead dog typically they pick themselves and as i mentioned they're typically the ones that are uh the strongest temperament or strongest personality they're the ones that that uh, really have that mentality to do what they need to do on their own and you'll see very quickly, if you put a dog up in lead that's not quite ready, they won't keep the line tight. They'll keep turning back. They'll keep looking back to, to see what direction they need. It, it's, it's, really like, it's really like an analogy of football. Those are the guys that can go out there and take charge. And then if we could, uh, the dogs, as you're working your way back, the next couple of dogs are called swing dogs. Those are the ones that are kind of swinging the team in one direction or another. So when you tell the lead dogs, G or Hall, left or right, uh, they're they're taking the command, and then the next two dogs are sort of swinging the team. The next group of dogs are the team dogs. Those are kind of like, you know, the offensive tackles or the tight ends of the group. <laughs> and then you have the wheel dogs, which are the dogs closest to the sled, and those are the typically the big brute dogs. Those are the offensive linemen, the dumb jocks of the of the dog sledding world. They're there just there to pull their weight and just kind of, you know, if you're you're thinking about football, they're the ones that are out there blocking and in the trenches and and doing their thing. And then of course you have the sled and then the the human part of the team, which is called a dog musher. Here in Alaska, there's 2,000 mile races. The Iditarod, which goes from Anchorage to Nome, and it's almost all off of the road system. So there's not a way to follow it unless you're involved with the race or kind of hop, skip, and, and jump over uh, from checkpoint to checkpoint. So that is a way to follow it along if you're a fan. Okay. The other 1,000 mile race is called the Yukon Quest, and it either starts in Fairbanks here in Alaska or Whitehorse down in the Yukon. And then they switch every year, and it's also a a thousand miler. But then there's all sorts of shorter races all around the country. Uh, There's 300 milers in Minnesota, and Montana, and Colorado, and and Oregon. (coughs) Excuse me. There's a 400 mile race in Minnesota, and there's even races up in your neck of the woods. They have the Can Am 250, which is up in Maine, and we've. But they had a uh, dog mushing exposition or a sort of a, a, a check it out type sport in the 1930s, which was right down from where you guys are right now at uh, Lake Placid. They did some dog sledding events in the Olympics. No way. You're definitely going to have to let us know when they, uh, the next one they do in Placid. We'll definitely be there. 
Well, you know, they've, they've never done it again. And that was sort of at the height of uh, mushing hysteria. That's when everybody really found out about it here in the States. And it was right after that serum run, which I talked about, where they delivered mm-hmm. that that vaccine to mm-hmm. know it was height of the popularity. And, and they tried it there in the Olympics. And it has not been done since. And that was in 1932, I think. I would love to see it in the Olympics again, especially in that sprint format that we talked about. I think it would be an awesome event to add to the Winter Olympics. And I think Lake Placid would would be a great place to hold it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That'd be cool. And uh, the one thing I wanted to mention is Greg and I uh, typically and have played for a number of years, played in a lacrosse tournament up in Lake Placid. A lot of fun. But regarding mushing and racing up there it's so mountainous and hilly that it seems like it wouldn't be the best place to do that for whatever reason i picture it needs to be a little bit more flat is that not the case i'm gonna guess you run on the rivers when they're Uh, frozen are you you talking about up here or down there oh at at lake placid just because it's in the adirondacks there's a lot of you know four thousand foot peaks not huge but at the same time there's not a lot of flat ground Right. You know, they currently do a race down in um, uh, uh, Utah, Montana, excuse me, Utah, Wyoming, and a little bit of Montana called the Pedigree Stage Stop. And each day they go from one town to another. So they may go for 20 or 30 miles or so. And each day they're, they're, they're kind of stopping and going again. I think that would be a cool way to do it up in your area where you know, you have really concentrated areas of population, whereas up here, you know, you may have a hundred miles between villages or maybe even further. Yeah, that's that's wild. That's That's wild. So I know that you you just broke down a little bit of the the Balto, the Iron Will, Eight Below, the Snow Dog stories, but you have to have some stories yourself about your dogs. I mean, living with 40 dogs, I can barely live with one fiance and two dogs. So tell me a little bit about that. See, the the, the key part of that was one fiance. Two uh, dogs yeah. is easy. It should one, be. <laughs> one fiance is the, the, the difficult part. <laughs> you know, I, I, I get told that often from my wife. She says you're spending more time with the dogs than you do <laughs> with me. And, you know, she she's my right-hand man, so to speak. She, she also... Uh, run sled dogs and she's sort of the main handler of the group she's the one that's you know doing all the care for him at the races while i'm gone and all that so so she she's a big part of this but yeah living with a team of sled dogs is truly like living with 30 or 40 three-year-olds just toddlers running around (laughs) so they have uh, you know a, a, a tremendous amount of energy and they're just constantly you know asking for attention and anybody that listens to this remembers what it's like to live with a puppy or a two-year-old dog at all times. And that's sort of what it's like. These guys are not house dogs. They're not the ones that are going to come in, lay at your lap while you're watching movies or, or uh, you know, watching Monday Night Football. These guys are, are high-energy athletes, and they're, they're literally born to run. That's what they, they love to do, and, and that's, that, you know, that's their mission in life. And it's interesting because one of the myths that you talked about in dog mushing is, oh, they're outside all the time and, you know, you don't care for them like like they should with, you know, if you if you own a dog. And most people that are saying that don't understand the athlete part of 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 the of the equation there. These guys do not want to come inside. They don't it doesn't matter how cold it is. They want to be outside with their buddies. They don't want to come in and hang out with with the humans of the pack. They want to be out there with their buddies. And that's, that's uh, an important part of this that, w- that we should definitely mention for sure. But a story or two. Well, man, here, let me I, I, keep, but, keep going. I love the stories. The one thing I want to interject with is that it makes sense. You know, it, you want to build that camaraderie with your dog counterparts. You know, it, even though we're humans, they're dogs. And you said it's like living with a bunch of three-year-olds, even at three, you know, you want to continue to build the, the friendships, the camaraderie, the teamwork, all that kind of stuff. So it makes sense to me. Uh, the one thing I wanted to ask, though, is when I was watching that documentary on losers, it's it didn't seem like many of the dogs looked um, appearance wise like traditional huskies or Malamutes. It looked like they were almost mixed breeds and things like that. Is that 
how, how I mean, are are they typically huskies or nowadays do you mix and and breed dogs a specific way to get certain physical characteristics and maybe leadership characteristics to benefit your your sled dog team? Yeah, almost every dog that is running today is a breed of dog called the Alaskan Husky, and that is the truly the Heinz 57 of a dog. They've taken the <laughs> uh, from different breeds, and you had mentioned the Siberian, which is what most people think of when they think of, of sled dog. It's the dog that looks, you know, kind of wolf-like with the with the furry the furry hair and the curly tail and the blue eyes and the pointy ears and all of that. We have three of those guys down in our kennel. They are uh, the purebreds of the group, but most of our dogs are that mix of several different breeds that go back hundreds of years to get that ideal sled dog, that dog that will that will pull for hundreds of miles, that has tough feet, that will eat, that have the intelligence. It is a dog that that has been bred and born to run, very similar to the other dogs that we think about. You know, you had mentioned a golden retriever. Golden retrievers were bred specifically to do specific things, whether they're mm-hmm. you know, retrieving dogs out, out in the field or working dogs with service dogs, or therapy dogs, that sort of thing. And they have that ability bred into them, but that dog just happened to be called the golden retriever. So how did you end up working with dogs? I can't remember uh, what you told us before. Uh, we uh, I ended up moving to Colorado. If we fast forward about eight years or so, and we opened up a dog training center called Denver Dog Works, and that was the true dog training facility where we had, you know, the the group classes and the boarding dogs and all that, and we probably trained, I don't know, 100 dogs a month or so there, and that went on for several years, and I ended up moving to Alaska in 2010, and we do the same thing up here, and probably over the years, uh, my wife and I have trained maybe a thousand, two thousand dogs over our career in every, wow. every, um, every breed, every behavior problem, every household experience that we've probably dealt with on on one time or another, and and we hope we're pretty good at it. Uh, we get clients all over the country that are asking for dog training services, or therapy dogs, or service dogs, or protection dogs, or whatever. Uh, we, we try to do our best to, to train them. So if someone is looking for dog training and your assistance, how do they find you? Well, they can definitely hear it about it on our podcast, DogWorks Radio, dogworksradio.com, or they can check out our website, Alaska Dog Works, uh, alaskadogworks.com, or anywhere on social media, just putting that in the search bar. There you go. Wonderful. There you go. Actually, there's one last thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, because it's interesting to me, but you have some experience working with service dogs and doing service dog training, right? Yes. So tell me a little bit about that, because the one thing that comes to mind for me, and I don't know if our listeners know this yet, but I I work to some degree within the pharmaceutical industry, but I, I ran into an office where it seems like people can almost get that service dog licensing um, just to maybe have their dog in their office in their in their in their workplace for for a certain amount of time or things like that and that's that's to, that's the education that I have about that so tell me a little bit about how your training and how how you do that with these dogs you know that's that's a great point unfortunately today anybody can say their dog is a service dog you can even buy uh, quote unquote certifications on the internet for you know, 20 or 30 bucks and they'll send you a patch or, or a cape or, or a vest or whatever you want. And you can right. literally take your dog into work with you. But you know, it, it's, it's like we tell all of our clients, you can have a dog that, that is well-trained that you can take, uh, you know, and, and help you with whatever condition that you have, or you can, fake it till you make it. And a lot of times it just doesn't work that way. The way that we do it here, we are the professionals of, of the service dog world. It'd be very similar to, you know, if, if you have a, a, a leaky roof, you can definitely get on a ladder and, and go up on the roof and fix it yourself, or you can hire a pro to do it for you. And that's what we do. And our uh, service dog training is a two year process. Uh, wow. We typically start with, with puppies and work with the clients over a two-year period, and we involve the clients in the entire 
training process, and we train service dogs for a, a variety of things. We have uh, service dogs for mobility, for conditions like cerebral palsy or folks that are in wheelchairs. We train autistic service dogs, typically for kids uh, that are uh, uh, condi- uh, you know, autistic or have that condition. Uh, we work with dogs uh, with PTSD, uh, typically for soldiers. Uh, we'll work with, with dogs in, in that training scenario and in, in different areas for different types of folks. And, and as we said, we, we do our best to train them to provide uh, therapy and services for them for, for, the, for, the, for the working life of the dog. And that's typically eight or 10 years. And, you know, we, we try to stand behind that. That's awesome. So I have a, a question for you. So some dogs can detect seizures in patients with epilepsy. Can you train a dog to detect that? You know, that's, that's a great question. And the way that we uh, ha- train our dogs here is we try to uh, not train dogs that are going to be life-saving mechanisms because we, we don't want to put our name behind something that may or may not happen. And when you're thinking about, oh, okay, well, I want you to train my dog for my daughter that has seizures. What happens that time where the dog doesn't do its job? And, and you know how dogs are. Dogs can be aloof, and if you know if you're if you're entrusting them to be lifesavers, that's something really serious. Mm-hmm. And I know there are companies out there that do train dogs for seizure alert or diabetic alert dogs and that sort of thing. And that's a specialty that we don't want to step into because I just I just can't put our name on something that that uh, may or may not happen for one reason or another. Yeah, no, I completely understand. That makes sense. I mean, dogs have their days too; they're off days. Right. And you don't want to, you know, put your name on something that you never know. You never know with a dog. They're just like people. Right. We have our bad days. They have their bad days, too. So, yeah, get the pointer, get the finger, uh, the finger (laughs) pointed, do it. The finger pointed at the wrong person. You know, like you said, you, you never know. And if if the dog's just not having it that day, a family, although they put the trust in you as a trainer and the dog, at some point, they're going to blame you, and I understand why you wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so anything else you want to really talk about? I know uh, we've covered a lot. You're a wealth of knowledge, and we appreciate you coming on and talking to us. But is there anything else you want to talk about in, in respect to either mushing or living in Alaska or anything else that's you know imperative or maybe people should know? You know, I could probably sit on here and talk to you guys all day. I love what you're doing with your podcast. I love finding new podcasts that are dog centric. I don't think there's enough of us out there. You know, we grind away every week on our podcast to try to to promote uh, dogs and our relationship with them on our show. And I know that you guys are doing the same. And it's just it's just a great example of of all the stories that are out there about dogs. And I think that that's so cool. You know, and podcasting is interesting because you're you're literally talking to a computer screen most of the time, whether you have a host or not. You don't really know who your listeners are. And I think podcasting is a very cool medium to reach the masses in a way that's so much different than the different types of media. And we talked about mushing and, you know, sort of pop culture references in movies and TV and whatnot. But I think podcasting is the new medium to reach that audience. And I think you guys are doing a great job with that. You guys have a different podcast than ours, whereas ours is more interviews and storytelling, where yours is just more back and forth banter. And I, I love that. And I think that's a cool way to go. And and I want to commend you guys for doing the work that you're doing and, and getting the message out because there needs to be more of us that are telling the stories about dogs for sure. I love that, man. I love that. You said it very well. You're very well spoken. We appreciate you coming on. Um, we like definitely you, want to have you on again at some point. It, absolutely. And I, I completely agree with everything you said. Um, moving forward, I think what Greg and I are going to do is try to start a, a dog sled team in upstate New York and Rochester uh, during the months of November to February. We'll try to figure it out. I don't think our uh, golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers will, will pair very well, but we're probably going to try. They'll do good enough. Thanks. It would be good enough. And like I said, I, I bet if you look hard enough, there is a bunch of mushing events in your area. I know that uh, 
uh, New Hampshire, which is right down the road from you guys. It's, everywhere is right down the road from you because literally we have to drive an hour to the grocery store. So driving over to New Hampshire from from Rochester is, is, is like an afternoon drive to us. But uh, there are there are mushing events all over the place in your area. I know that there's there is our there are sled dog clubs there are everything that's happening there there's all sorts of dog sports up in your area whether it be dog mushing or dock diving or you know scent trials or whatever i think you guys can have topics galore for your podcast that's awesome that just gave me a couple great ideas because the dock diving is is huge especially with the finger lakes over here in upstate new york you you have so many dogs that honestly, my fiance's puppy. Uh, before we started uh, dating, he didn't even know how to swim, really. You know, and and realistically, these dogs are are bred to swim. So the dock diving is amazing, and then the scent the scent side of things, which I think you're mentioning, is is more about the hunting. So upstate New York is pretty much primarily mm-hmm. woods. So. People are yeah, hunting all over the place. A lot of lakes and a lot of woods. Yes. But, um, Robert, I appreciate you coming on. You're the man. Um, we'd love to have you on again at any point, uh, you know, even if it's a couple weeks from now. But I appreciate the feedback. Uh, you're doing a great job with your podcast. So tell everybody where they can get more education about mushing or follow you or however uh, you want to relay that information to them. All right. You can definitely check out our podcast anywhere you listen to podcasts, whether it be Apple or Stitcher or Spotify or whatever. Just search for Dog Works Radio. We do a weekly show. We have several different uh, shows on our our little network, if you will. And uh, we have cool coverage during the Iditarod, which is what we talked about every March. So definitely check us out at dogworksradio.com. You can find out more about our dog training services at Alaska Dog Works and alaskadogworks.com. Just search for those words in any search bar on social media and we'll pop up. And uh, we'll definitely share this episode away on all of our social media so people can find you as well. Uh, You're the man. We appreciate you. Um, We're on the other side of the country, but we're very similar. And I can't wait to do this again. I appreciate everything. So let's wrap it up, Greg. We usually wrap up our episode by saying wag more, bark less. And don't forget to follow us everywhere that you listen to podcasts at Barkology Podcast. Uh, Barkology Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter is Barkology Pod. And don't forget to check out the WAG swag at Barkology.itemorder.com. We out.